We're continuing with Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park. We are on page 24, and we're starting with New York. Dr. Richard Stone, head of the Tropical Diseases Laboratory of Columbia University Medical Center, often remarked that the name conjured up a grander place than it actually was. In the early 20th century, when the laboratory occupied the entire fourth floor of the Biomedical Research Building, crews of technicians worked to eliminate the scourges of yellow fever, malaria, and cholera. But medical successes in research laboratories in Nairobi and San Pablo had left the TDL a much less important place than it once was. Now a fraction of its former size it employed only two full-time technicians, and they were primarily concerned with diagnosing illnesses of New Yorkers who had traveled abroad. The lab's comfortable routine was unprepared for what it received that morning. Oh, very nice, the technician in the tropical diseases laboratory said as she read the customs label, partially masticated fragment of an unidentified Costa Rican lizard. She wrinkled her nose. This one's all yours, Dr. Stone. Richard Stone crossed the lab to inspect the new arrival. Is this the material from Ed Simpson's lab? Yes, she said, but I don't know why they'd send a lizard to us. His secretary called, Stone said. Simpson's on a field trip in Borneo for the summer. Borneo for the summer? And because there's a question of communicable disease with the lizard, she asked her lab to take a look at it. Let's see what we've got. The white plastic cylinder was the size of a half gallon milk container. It had look locking metal latches and a screw top. It was labeled International Biological Specimen Container and plastered with stickers and warnings in four languages. The warnings were intended to keep the cylinder from being opened by suspicious custom officials. Apparently the warnings had worked. As Richard Stone swung the big light over, he could see sills were still intact. Stone turned on the air handlers and pulled on plastic gloves and a face mask. After all, the lab had recently identified specimens contaminated with the Venezuelan equine fever, Japanese bee encephalitis, Kazar forest virus, Langat virus, and Mayoro. Then he unscrewed the top. There was a hiss of escaping gas and white smoke boiled out. The cylinder turned frosty cold. Inside, he found a plastic Ziploc sandwich bag containing something green. Stone spread a surgical drape on the table and shook out the contents of the bag. A piece of frozen flesh struck the table with a dull thud. Hmm, the technician said. It looks eaten. Yes, it does, Stone said. What do they want with us? The technician consulted the enclosed documents. Lizard is biting local children. They have a question about the identification of the species and a concern about diseases transmitted from the bite. She produced a child's picture of a lizard sign Tina at the top. One of the kids drew a picture of the lizard Stone glanced at the picture. Obviously, we can't verify the species Stone's dead, but we can check diseases easily enough. If we can get any blood out of this fragment, what are they calling this animal? A basiliscus amaratus with three-toed genetic anomaly. Okay, Stone said, let's get started. While you're waiting for it to thaw, do an x-ray and take Polaroids for the record. Once we have blood, start running antibiotic sets until we get some matches. Let me know if there's a problem. 
Before lunchtime, the lab had to answer the answer. The lizard blood showed no significant reactivity to any viral or bacterial antigen. They had run toxicity profiles as well, and they had found only one positive match. The blood was mildly reactive to the venom of the Indian king cobra. But such cross-reactivity was common among reptile species, and Dr. Stone did not think it noteworthy to include in the facts his technicians sent to Dr. Martin Guterres that same evening. There was never any question about identifying the lizard. That would await the return of Dr. Simpson. He was not due back for several weeks, and his secretary asked if the TDL would please store the lizard fragment in the meantime. Dr. Stone put it back in the Ziploc bag and stuck it in the freezer. Martin Gutierrez read the facts from the Columbus Medical Center Typical Disease Laboratory. It was brief. Subject, Basilisex amaretus with genetic anomaly, forwarded by Dr. Simpson's office. Materials posterior segment, partially eaten animal. Procedures performed, x-ray, microscopic immunology, RTX for viral, parasitic, bacterial disease. Findings, no histolic or immunologic evidence for any communicable disease in man in the basilix amaretus sample. Signed, Richard A. Stone, MD Director. Gutierrez made two assumptions based on the memo. First, that his identification of the lizard as a basilix had been confirmed by scientists at Columbia University. And second, that the absence of a communicable disease meant the recent episodes of sporadic lizard bites implied no serious health hazards for Costa Rica. On the contrary, he felt his original views were correct, that a lizard species had been driven from the forest into a new habitat and was coming into contact with village people. Gutierrez was certain that in a few more weeks the lizard would settle down and the biting episodes would end. The tropical rain fell in great drenching sheets, hammering the corrugated roof at the clinic in Baja, Anasco. It was nearly midnight, power had been lost in the storm, and the midwife, Elena Morales, was working by flashlight when she heard a squeaking, chirping sound. Thinking that it was a rat, she quickly put a compress on her forehead of the mother and went into the next room to check on the newborn baby. As her hand touched the doorknob, she heard chirping again and she relaxed. Evidently, it was just a bird flying in the window to get out of the rain. Costa Ricans said that was a, when a bird came to visit a newborn child, it brought good luck. Elena opened the door, and the infant lay in a wicker bassinet, swaddled in a light blanket, only its face exposed. exposed. Around the rim of the bassinet, three dark green lizards crouched like gargoyles. When they saw Elena, they cocked their heads and stared curiously at her, but they did not flee. In the light of her flashlight, Elena saw the blood dripping from their snouts. Softly chirping, one lizard bent down and with a quick shake of his head, tore a ragged chunk of flesh from the baby. Elena rushed forward screaming and the lizards fled into the darkness, but long before she reached the bassinet, she could see what had happened to the infant's face and she knew the child must be dead. The lizard scattered into the rainy night, chirping and squealing, leaving behind only bloody three-toed tracks like birds.